it's been a pleasant surprise how much of this 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 kind of startup tool set works in a, in a company like Wayfair making this push to kind of take things to the next level. Hello, my name is Fusun Wehrmann. I'm Director of Engineering and Product at Wayfair in Berlin in supply chain. Today I'm going to talk to Pepe Ciardelli, who is the Associate Director of Product um, in Global Carrier Platform, about his experiences about product management, how he got to Wayfair, and a couple of other things. So, Pepe, you studied international relations at Stanford. I did. And then you were a developer. Mm -hmm. And then how did it happen that you ended up being a product manager? I think I'm not the kind of person who is destined to spend 95% of my time behind a screen. Mm -hmm. I think there's always a big social part of me that was kind of not fulfilled as a developer. Um, and then the actual thing that, that triggered the change was I was working um, in an academic con uh, context. I was working uh, at the Botanical Garden here in, in Germany um, on a project, kind of like a, a three-year horizon where we had to deliver something a few times a year. And for obvious reasons, the project just wasn't moving forward. And I started kind of started research on, okay, what are some ways we can deliver results on a regular basis, and then you quickly get into kind of agile methodology. Um, we had the advantage of we worked in an actual museum down the hall from scientists who'd be using our product. Um, so then you get into, okay, kind of usability, best practices, stay in contest, constant touch with your users, um, show people the software you're developing for them as you're developing it. And basically those two things were kind of the building block of product management. And I kind of was able to, uh, after doing that for a year or two, um, make the jump into real product management um, with um, the company, the AdTech Sphere, which is where we met. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, about ten years ago, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's the short, the short version of it. Yeah, and since then you've been to different roles, also in leadership positions. And apart from knowing me, what brought you to Wayfair? Uh, we've established a certain market dominance, especially in the U.S. Uh, we're, we're starting to dip our toe into profitability um, and I think we're, we're kind of making a big like professionalization push right now. Um, and I think one thing I noticed when I was interviewing with Wayfair was, so Wayfair is the first company I've worked for in 10 years of more than 200 people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it's been a really pleasant surprise how much um, of kind of like the, the toolbox that, uh, that I assembled to kind of working in these small startups also works in a, in, a, in a big company context. So I think, yeah, I think I've, it's been a pleasant surprise how much of this, this, this kind of startup tool set works in a, in a company like Wayfair making this push to kind of take things to the next level. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so you just mentioned that your experience in smaller companies were relevant for Wayfair. Um, what advice do you have for the product managers who might be working for a smaller company and um, want to apply at Wayfair? What skills and um, capabilities are necessary? Yeah. I think the things that make you successful in a small company, in a startup environment, in a very entrepreneurial environment will also make you successful at Wayfair. So those are the kinds of things we look for. Um, real kind of product management best practices, things like kind of communicating a vision to your team, kind of uh, putting together OKRs, putting together roadmaps to show, okay, this is what we're doing this quarter to make progress towards this vision, uh, which is very similar to the way uh, we all work like in, in startups. Um, I think the biggest difference is just the relationship we have with our stakeholders is a bit different, um, especially now in Corona times. You're not kind of sitting in a small office with everybody you do have kind of a wider circle of people. You kind of have to keep up to date and establish these kind of transparency rituals for. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a certain kind of communication style and kind of a, a certain way of putting together buy-in that's maybe a little bit different than, than, than the startup mm -hmm. uh, startups I've worked in. So that's been the, kind of the biggest difference and that's, that's something I, we tend to zero in on, on interviews as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the interview process at Wayfair itself, um, how did you find it? What's your honest feedback about the whole process? Honest feedback is be ready for several rounds. <laughs> um, but I think Wayfair does a pretty good job 
explaining to you why that is. So the process is basically you start with uh, yeah, your classic HR screen. Uh, then you get to then you speak for the first time with your your hiring manager. Um, and that's just a real kind of uh, bird's eye view. Who are you? What is uh, what are your product philosophy? Um, things like this. And then you go into a series of interviews um, around each of like the Wayfair core competencies, um, things like communication, stakeholder management, um, critical thinking, innovation skills, things like that. And then you also get um, a little exercise that you can do to kind of stretch your, your product muscles mm -hmm. in front of one of our one of our product people. Um, yeah, and then uh, I think Wayfair also does a good job kind of like trying to remove basically bias from the process. We all make a point of not not talking too much about the candidates as, as in the pipeline. And yeah, it, it felt like a lot at the time, um, but I think it's a pretty fair process. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's 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 one point. That's one uh, point where I do appreciate working in a larger company. Mm -hmm. I think it is pretty well done all in all. And now that um, you join Wayfair and you are one of the important key leaders building the global care platform, mm -hmm. can you Tell us a little bit about this platform. What is it good for? And maybe we can go into the details afterwards. Yeah, um, I think one thing that's maybe not surprising, but uh, one thing you have to understand about Wayfair, it's been growing very fast for a number of years now. And I think uh, I would call this growth from a systems perspective kind of organic, <laughs> <laughs> especially when you get into kind of the EU um side of things where we got a mandate and when did we come to the eu like 2015 2016 yeah. um with the kind of the mandate just establish a market position however you can right get get a um set up a delivery network on the ground find suppliers find carriers and starting this year we've really kind of made a, a concerted effort to okay let's consolidate this and let's kind of professionalize our system let's move away from a monolithic architecture and our particular group wafer global platform was kind of formed around the idea that, okay, um, let's form teams around single sources of truth. So around a carrier source of truth, around a supplier source of truth, um, give them a global mandate, which was new for us here in Berlin and super exciting. Um, and we're basically responsible for all things carrier. And our goal is to basically represent or kind of expose a very heterogeneous bunch of carriers. Um, through generic interfaces to the rest of the company. So that if you uh, basically, so we're in a system now where different systems along the supply chain might have different ways of integrating with carriers, mm -hmm. right? And that obviously brings a lot of overhead, um, brings a lot of complexity and just kind of stretches out the time it takes to onboard a carrier to our system. Um, what we're doing now is building a system where there's a single point of integration and one of our main KPIs is just get another carrier on board as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good example of, of how we're trying to kind of flatten the carrier landscape for the rest of the company. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, probably the second thing that's worth mentioning is um, we have a very, I, a lot of kind of uh, improvised tool sets that some of our frontline mm -hmm. um, operational um, colleagues use. Um, a lot of Google Sheets, to be perfectly honest. And mm -hmm. I think our job going forward will be to get this out of, uh, okay, a frontline operations person is responsible for getting their own data and get them more into the mode where um, we give them the data they need um, in a timely fashion, um, in an intuitive way, uh, with well-built tools that speak to their use cases. And they can concentrate more on strategy mm -hmm. instead of just getting the data together to figure out what's happening on the ground. So. Yeah, and I remember when we were running the discovery after we got the mandate to build a global platform, after a while you said, hey people stop, we need to do this differently and we need to go talk to several people and come up with personas. Yeah. So can you tell a little bit more what was what initiated that idea and how was it working uh, with product managers that have never done it before? So and. Yeah. How, how successful was it for you? Yeah, personas is one of these uh, kind of abused terms in the industry where um, a bunch of kind of hippos sit in the room together and say, okay, these are the three or four uh, user types we're gonna develop product for. Uh, we kind of have the resources and also the mandates at uh, Wayfair to do this a bit more professionally. And uh, we really sat together in summer and said, okay, um, to really do this well, Let's um, interview like an exhaustive cross-section of kind of the ops landscape of everybody who works with carriers. Yeah? 
Uh, we had a product manager on it full time. We had like a, um, a usability person on it about half our time. For about a month, uh, we got all the product managers in the uh, global carrier platform team involved. Uh, made sure everybody is actually able to interview somebody who works with carriers all day, right? And we really kind of zeroed in on two things. What, what does their daily business look like um, in terms of how are you judged on success? Uh, what KPIs um, do you work with to see how things are going on in the ground? And most importantly, what are your pain points right now, right? And I think if you do a persona as well, these pain points, if you flip them around, basically tell you exactly which software to build, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we, we uh, pretty quickly started to notice the pain points were, first of all, we could put them in about three or four different buckets. Um, and then that we noticed a lot of consistency. Once you, put, once you notice which bucket people were in, people were giving us the same pain points again and again. Um, and once you had this, it was pretty easy to put together like, um, yeah, like a four quarter roadmap for, for what, what kind of tools we want to develop for people over the next year. And again, a lot of this is going to be how can we automate um, getting data, seeing what's happening on the ground, visualizing the network so that people don't have to spend time uh, with their carrier partners saying, OK, uh, just trying to figure out what's happening and actually be a bit more proactive. Uh, and get out of the reactive basis a lot of our colleagues are unfortunately mm -hmm. on right now. I know that it's not really easy to build that platform and even coming up with great ideas and plans is not enough. So mm -hmm. what are the biggest challenges for you today when building the platform? I think the biggest challenge is probably the heterogeneity, if that's a <laughs> word. Um, yeah, the, the incredible nuance of the data we work with. I mean, the the wildly varying technical sophistication of the carriers we work with uh, means that it's pretty hard to standardize data. Mm -hmm. And even more than that, to communicate to our stakeholders um, where this nuance is in the data and why maybe the data is not behaving in ways they expect. So a lot of, a lot of our job is kind of taming the data, building tools uh, on top of the state of the data the way it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, finding ways to improve the data on a steady basis. That also gets us uh, a lot more into like process work. Um, how can we improve kind of the, the relationship with carriers to get better data into the system and things like this. So it is a data job. Uh, a lot of what we do are data tasks and the quality of the data varies greatly. <laughs> and that's kind of one of our main challenges is kind of making sure we're always making progress on improving the, the quality of the data we, we provide to our users. Many stakeholders and users depend on the platform you build today. And on a day-to-day -day basis, when they have problems, issues, they come to you, ask questions, and they need solutions, you know, ur urgent for, ur for their urgent needs. Um, on the other side, we expect you and your team to come up with durable missions, um, long-term value and build roadmaps. So how do you balance that? How do you make sure that you deliver for urgent short-term needs and then build roadmaps for a couple of years? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that's kind of the essence of product work in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, always kind of how do you make the trade-offs between short-term firefighting basically, and kind of building sustainable systems in the long term. Um, I think a lot of what we do comes back to the issue of transparency. Um, so first of all, really making clear to stakeholders like what the trade-offs are, saying, OK, here's, here's a product manager um, who can answer your questions and help you out and solve this problem right now. Um, but this means that probably this other project um, that, that you've been involved in will, will be pushed back accordingly a little bit. Are you, are, are you aware of this trade-off? Can we make this together? Um, I think it's worth it in this case, or maybe it's not worth it in this case for this reason. Um, yeah, and it's also kind of an art with, with, uh, with the team members um, trying to have a feel for, for how much time they're, they're, uh, they're spending on ad hoc queries into the data. Um, to make sure they're not just spending all their time kind of responding to firefighting things mm -hmm. without being too intrusive and micromanaging. And that's kind of, kind of the art of, of, kind of, develop, of, mm -hmm. of managing this big, this big data machine we're, we're sitting on top of. So. Yeah. So roadmaps, I think it's a controversial topic and mm -hmm. um, some stakeholders, people from business, 
they would like to see it as a list of commitments that you make. Yeah. Um, engineers, on the other hand, if you talk to them, they say, okay, everything behind six months is probably going to change. And, you know, yeah. do we really need to take it seriously? So what's your view on this? How realistic is it to build a roadmap for two years? I think both sides have a lot of stereotypes about the other side. Mm -hmm. um, I think our stakeholders on the business side are much more prepared to work with the idea of a living document than we give them credit for. The nature of somebody on the business side's job um, is that they need to work with dates, um, they need to know when things will be ready, and they need to know as quickly as possible when uh, those dates are no longer operative, right? Um, and on the other side, I think it's, it's kind of a trust issue. Like uh, if you, um, if somebody um, on the engineering team or the product side um, gives us an estimate of how long something will take, when they can deliver something, they're only going to uh, give you that estimate um, if they can trust us to um, listen to them when things change, right? Um, because otherwise you kind of get into the loop where you spend all your time estimating things and kind of, yeah, spend, spend two weeks estimating a project that takes three weeks to implement. Yeah? So that's, um, I think you need a lot of trust on both sides to realize you're working with living documents. The deal is um, if we give you a lot of transparency as to what exactly we're doing, when things change, um, how can we make these trade-offs together, then you'll kind of let the teams work in peace and, and develop and make progress on the roadmap. How do you communicate in this huge company with thousands of people in engineering and product and probably also some thousands in operations who are our closest partners? Yeah. Do you do things regularly? Is it ad hoc? Do you like doing it more in meetings or in written form? What works best? Yeah. What works best is a good question. <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been here since, since February, so um, a little more than six months. And again, this is something that's different in, in a big company than it is in a startup. I think it's still a very email-centric company, for, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. Um, and, but I think this kind of, I think you need to have a certain marketing skill when you're speaking to such a large audience. You need to uh, do a very catchy, too long, don't read um, at the top of your emails. You need to, uh, it's basically email marketing in a lot of these things, right? Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is there's still a lot more person to person that needs to happen as well. I think you need to um, kind of identify the multipliers um, within kind of uh, management within Wayfair to, to get your get your message across. Um, I think you kind of need to cultivate relationships and kind of provide this transparency we talked about before mm -hmm. on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, and strangely enough, I think like this Corona thing has actually really helped us get closer to like our North American stakeholders, because now that all of our conversations take place via the computer, um, kind of the important, you know, it's no longer let's go out for a coffee. Um, it's more or less just drink coffee together in front of this stupid little screen. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. And I think another important thing is to try to get involved in, I mean, Wayfair does a really good job of kind of setting up like larger forums for people, um, engineering all hands for all of Berlin, uh, maybe like round tables for like uh, the, all the associate directors in both North America and Europe. I think it's really important that we all like kind of take, take advantage of this and kind of represent the department and, and kind of, yeah, make, make sure people, people see who we are and like what drives us and what's, what makes us passionate and like these, these all Wayfair forums as well. Mm -hmm. And now that we are working from home, I have the feeling we are creating more documents as product mm -hmm. managers, you yeah. know, mails and presentations and whatnot. So how did it change for you and how much PowerPoint work do you have in your job? <laughs> um, it's not a PowerPoint centric company. Um, it's a document centric company. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the way discussions take place um, and I don't know if this is a big company thing or this is maybe something that a, a best practice at Amazon started. But we have a lot of iterating on a document in a group, using the comments in the document. And at first, uh, there was a bit of culture shock for me getting used to this, because I, you know, I think a lot of product work is kind of distilling things to a few messages that do fit well into a slide. Um, but I found this iterating on a document in this big company where there's so many moving parts and system boundaries aren't really clear, I've actually found it a pretty efficient way um, to define things very sharply. So we're mm -hmm. talking about maybe like a five page document 
10 people working on, somebody asks a question, somebody else answers it, it raises more questions. We've been able to iterate on pretty complex topics within, let's say, like a week. Um, so I've actually been yeah, kind of pleasantly surprised by how efficient the, the, these big blocks of text have been mm -hmm. for us over the last few months. Yeah. And your team uses OKRs mm -hmm. for quarterly goals. So why do you use them and what are the pros and cons for you? I'm a big fan of OKRs. Um, I think it's a really good way to get different teams aligned. We, some of our biggest stakeholders are just starting to use OKRs right now. And I think that's where it gets, yeah, that's where like the magic starts to happen. Um, that's where you get kind of the conversations on more of a numerical basis, a more quantitative basis. Um, and I think that's where like the trade-offs become clear to both sides. Yeah, where you kind of, so if, if we're a tech team and maybe four stakeholders depend on us, I think if both sides are doing OKRs, that's a good way to see where the IT bottlenecks are and kind of, yeah, resolve those ahead of time. Um, that said, there's a lot of kind of, you can also do that with a well-planned roadmap. And I think one thing we struggle with right now is finding meaningful uh, numbers to work against. Because I think, especially in the supply chain area, so a good example is um, uh, one of our main KPIs is how many times does the customer um, contact support? And, and that's, that's a number that has, I would say, probably like hundreds of factors moving it, right? So it's, this is kind of our main, this would be like the main metric we're trying to move with our OKRs, um, but it's basically impossible to, to isolate uh, for any meaningful work. So finding something that applies to us specifically is, is something I think it's, I think we're better now than when, so now we're in Q, we just started Q4, I started the end of uh, Q1. Um, I think we've been doing OKRs for like a year total now, and mm -hmm. I think we're just starting to get to the point where, where these, these numbers, these KPIs we're working against are more meaningful. Uh, we have like really good buy-in from the team on the OKRs as well. I think they're like really, they're a part of day-to-day -day work. Uh, product managers feel empowered to say, um, okay, stakeholder, really good idea, um, but that's not part of our OKRs right now. That's not what we're trying to achieve this quarter. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think the, the important message is it takes several quarters to establish something like that. It's hard to find meaningful metrics, mm -hmm. but I think we're on a good path and it makes sense for us. And you know, when you set the OKRs, are you going for ambitious goals or are you going for realistic goals? What, what works at OFR? <laughs> this is one of the hardest parts, right? Yeah. This whole, uh, as to, because classic, so the, you know, invented by Google and the idea was, okay, um, success is you achieve 70% of your goal. Um, that's kind of a nuanced thing to communicate to stakeholders who are kind of, if they achieve 70% of something, they get their feet to the fire, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's kind of a cultural, dis uh, kind of a cultural gulf between uh, the way product and IT tick um, and the way business people tick. Um, and I think that's something we've talked about. Do we? Yeah, is, is that really? Is that part of the whole system that we can maybe put aside for now while we're kind of yeah. establishing this? I think the reality of supply chain is also a little different, and it's really hard to put something half baked to protection yeah. to the hands of the user. Maybe let's talk about the um, MVPs a little. Um, first of all, do you do you believe in MVP concept? And mm -hmm. is it something that we can successfully use um, in supply chain? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I think the key to a good MVP, I mean, the, the name is, the name tells you what you're looking for, like the minimum viable product, right? So it's important that you the key is really choosing a first piece of work that actually provides some value, right? So really breaking off, okay, eventually um, I want to make a tool that covers, uh, yeah, the entire carrier journey, but the first version of this tool is just going to focus on this one use case, um, and I'm going to try and fulfill the needs of this one trusted stakeholder I can iterate with. Um, it works, but you can quickly, I mean, there's an art to not getting sucked completely into this one use case and making sure you, you have like kind of a, an adoption path for how you would, how you would kind of expand the tool into, into all the, all the use cases you want to treat. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's an art. It's not always, it's not always successful, <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot of stakeholder management around it all. And you really have to keep, keep kind of keep your eyes on the prize and say, okay, 
yeah, I know it doesn't do this, it doesn't do this, I doesn't do this, but we're looking at this one particular use case in this one particular context, mm -hmm. and that's how we're going to define success. So, so Pepe, I can imagine in order to have successful relationships with the stakeholder, um, you need to know what you're talking about. And um, just like me, you came to supply chain yeah. world without uh, previous experience in that field. Yeah. Um, how long did it take and how hard was it for you? Um, it's not over yet <laughs> and it's still very difficult. Um, just because again, I think the nature of, so I, I work in, in tracking. So basically, um, you know, uh, basically a package gets a label put on it in the warehouse. And every time something changes in the state of this package, somebody is supposed to scan this and we get the scan from the carrier in some form. Um, so what this basically means is this is a real world entity moving in and out of various systems of varying technical sophistication, right? right. And there's a lot can go wrong. Um, there's a lot of nuance in that. And it's not a logical system a lot of times, right? And I think it's, it's, a, it's a lot to communicate to stakeholders, right? Um, so I think for me, the challenge is really to like say what I don't know kind of always notice when we're kind of like getting bogged down in kind of uh, technical details and really knowing when to back up um, in a diplomatic fashion. Say, okay, what's, what's the big picture of what we're talking about right here? And just kind of really being sure not to waste too many people's time and looking at meeting agendas. And if this is a meeting where I think I will need help from experts, making sure I can, I can bring people into that meeting with me to, to, to back me up on things I don't have mm -hmm. quite the depth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I yeah. would need to answer the questions I anticipate. So. Yeah. But after, after like two or three quarters, you realize how much you learned about supply chain yeah. and how much domain know-how you, you obtained. Yeah. And, um, it was for me, you know, one of the highlights of the first year. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, it is a real world thing. It's not, it's not, you know, I've done a lot of consumer work and it's kind of voodoo, you know, why do consumers do what they do on a website? Right. Mm -hmm. But this is anytime things are getting super overwhelming and too abstract, you always you can always go back to something is happening in the real world. Something is happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, things are going wrong um, in this warehouse for a concrete reason. You know? right. So I think once you every time I feel kind of overwhelmed by the topic, it's always just a matter of, OK, what is happening in the real world? So yeah. that, that, that helps me a lot. Frankly. It's a very fresh morning in Berlin, as the Germans say it. So it means cold. <laughs> <laughs> so we needed a little break and a coffee, a cup of co uh, warm coffee. And now we are sitting in the sun. So Pepe, I would like to talk about learning and development with you a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if I'm honest with you, that topic in product management is a little bit fuzzier for me. When it comes to engineering, I have a better idea what makes a software engineer or an engineering manager better. Yeah. Um, what would, you, what would you say uh, that the product managers need and ask for today for their career growth? Hmm, that's a good question because I, I agree with you. It is kind of a, a learning by doing task in a lot of ways. Um, one concrete thing uh, the, the team asked for, is particularly in this space, um, is training around uh, just data topics, uh, things like SQL training. Um, generally, I think Wayfair offers a few like data analysis, internal trainings, people want to take part in that. Um, but in terms of like raw um, product management skills, um, I think there I'm probably more a fan of the idea of guilds and just like regular forums where product managers kind of, kind of swap what's been working for them recently, what works well for them in Wayfair, what maybe worked in other jobs that doesn't work so well in Wayfair. So I think that's something we're kind of at the beginning of setting up uh, within Berlin. But I think that'll be, if we really want to kind of, if we want Berlin to be a source of like product management best practices, I think that's something we need to take a lot more seriously and kind of create like a society of, of product people here, here in Berlin and in, in the larger company as well. And if I come to Wayfair, to your team as a product manager, mm -hmm. what kind of career path do I have? Oof. The hard questions after the break. Okay. <laughs> there's a few directions you can go in, right? There are, again, there's, there's like the very data-centric path, like the classic technical PM path, I think we would call it in, in this context. 
we're going to get increasingly into like kind of tooling based around specific workflows that we, we kind of investigate and define. Um, so I think that would be more kind of a classic user centric kind of kind of product management. I think we could also offer you a path of somebody who's really wants to uh, focus more on, on communication and kind of pushing like large initiatives through the organization and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think those are kind of the three directions you could take your, your product skills on the team. And just more generally, um, I think we have kind of, if I look at our team right now, there are kind of a few different models for um, how product managers want to want to take their career. Um, again, I think a lot of it is when we get, when we get the idea of product best practices, we're kind of trying to establish more, kind of really setting aside some space to do really good discovery work. Um, again, this persona work, a lot of user research, a lot of working um, closely with, uh, with kind of usability issues and things like that. So I think these are some of the directions we, we could offer you at, at Wayfair mm -hmm. as a product person. And um, I know building a global product means working with users and stakeholders from different time zones, from different countries and continents. Mm -hmm. How is work-life balance at Wayfair and how do you keep it balanced? Yeah, um, yeah I have four-year-old twins, <laughs> so it's definitely people respect that. You respect that a lot. Um, and I think the colleagues in the U.S. Um, have been making an effort. So just if, for those who don't know, um, we have basically a six-hour time gap. Um, we also work with our colleagues um, in Ireland quite a lot. There's a one-hour time gap there. Um, if something is urgent and there's no other slot, you might have a six to seven meeting, but that's that's pretty rare. And I think people are pretty respectful of the time differences. Um, but again, my thing is if, if work is sometimes work is in a phase where it's fun and you enjoy thinking about it under the shower and you enjoy maybe uh, kind of uh, you get a way to, to form your thoughts at, at 10 at night and you open your computer and you you kind of finish a thought that you had all day and we're kind of waiting for that breakthrough. So yeah, it's, I think um, the pace is pretty uh, pretty fast, um, generally at Wayfair. Um, but I think people do respect the fact that we're in different time zones and people have different um, yeah, private lives. Some people have families, some people don't. Um, and I think as long as you're as long as you're delivering whatever it takes, um, yeah, mm -hmm. there's different leeway for different yeah, different arrangements. And how did COVID? impact you, um, <laughs> especially in terms of work-life balance and the pace? Uh, is it better? Is it yeah. slower? What did you observe? Oh well, yeah, it was obviously slower at first. Um, I think it took everyone a long time to kind of get their feet on the ground. Um, I think you notice a big difference on, on the family front. Um, you know, Europe kind of got the preschools up and running um, a lot earlier um, than the U.S. did. So I think uh, my kids have been in the video calls a lot less than the uh, um, and the American colleagues. Mm -hmm. I don't know, when, 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 when did your son, Alan, go and go back to school exactly? I think he was back in June again. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I think we, yeah, we kind of approached normalcy a bit, a bit probably more, more quickly than the U.S. colleagues did. Um, but now at this point, I think we're, I think we're all working, yeah, f full days uh, in a way we were before, is my impression. I don't know, I mean, would you... I think you're working more than ever, <laughs> would, would be my impression. So. Um, I think I have more time for spending at the computer. You know, I used to spend a lot of time for traveling mm -hmm. to United States and back sometimes once a month, sometimes twice a month. I spend a good amount of time commuting to office yeah. and bringing my son to school and back. And so I have the feeling I have maybe 10 plus hours a month to mm -hmm. invest in my teams and in other yeah. things. And uh, I'm not searching for meeting, round, uh, meeting rooms in the office. So that all gives us an extra time to work and concentrate on. Yeah. But you are right. I see that I am working more densely and yeah. we have a lot, half an hour meetings back to back, back to back. So I can imagine if I'm concentrated on one product and I have to, you know, yeah. work as a product manager. Maybe that's something I want to be mindful about and block my time or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and I think yeah, I think that's really important that uh, we tell our teams. So, so first of all, I think uh, generally Wayfair as a culture has noticed this back to back to back to back thing is a recipe for burnout. Yeah. And I think in the last few weeks, people have been kind of backing off that a little bit. Yeah. 
And secondly, I've, I've told my team, listen, if you, if you need some space, if you need to turn down some meetings and you, you want me to cover your back, just, just let me know. Um, Cause it is really easy to just kind of press that button and invite more people to a meeting. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think after a few months of this, people are kind of more cognizant of the fact that, yeah, that's, that's, it's a bit much. And I think we're kind of adjusting as a culture. And I think people are kind of, yeah, I think people are kind of reflecting a lot on how it's going. Um, I know it's kind of management is kind of really trying to make sure people are kind of observing their mental health and kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, making sure they have, they have time for themselves, time for their families. Um, yeah, I think I feel, I feel, uh, I don't know if protected is a word, but I feel, yeah, I feel like they've got my back generally in, this, in these strange times. So. That's good to hear. As an engineer myself, I'm always curious about what makes product managers excited. So is there yeah. anything out there where you think it's promising for your field or that you wish to work with any technology that makes you excited? I am not particularly a product manager driven by technology as such. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's exciting to be working right now. I mean, basically a lot of what we do right now um, is based on an event model, is based on kind of distributed services. And I think these, these technologies are really mature right now. And I think what we're doing wouldn't work mm -hmm. uh, if we tried to do something similar five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's fun to see like a technology kind of, kind of reach maturity that people were talking about a lot a few years ago and just kind of falling on their face. And I think now we're, we're building some very cool systems on like very kind of distributed models. Um, but I think kind of, kind of the people aspect and the like solving pain points aspect is still, will always kind of be where, where my sweet spot is. And in spite of my engineering background, I think it's like the people aspect more than the technology aspect that drives me mm -hmm. personally. How are you sure that the uh, engineering partners are making the right cho choices for you. I mean, they ask for refactoring time and they yeah. uh, change the architecture. Um, how do you make sure that we are not over engineering or building technical debt for yeah. fast results? This is also a classic uh, product management question. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is something that becomes even more relevant in a big, largely monolithic system like the one we sit on top of um, because you could in theory do nothing but refactor <laughs> for the next two years um, I think it's like any management position where you find out it's I mean it's basically journalistic you know you you can ask 10 people the same question get 10 similar but not the same answers and you find out which people in your circle have a, uh, you find especially credible you kind of rely on them say, hey, what, what, what do you think of this problem? I mean, what do you, I, this answer doesn't quite feel right to me. Let, let me get your opinion on that. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think a large part of management is just finding out like your kind of, your, your, your trusted truth tellers who kind of like investigate a situation together with you. Um, and yeah, I think, I think these, are, these are people with a certain amount of experience. You can, you can find them pretty quickly and like you're kind of, you're, yeah. Your partners in crime navigating, uh, yeah, these kind of Byzantine systems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's kind of, it's kind of, and I think a lot of it is you accumulate enough experience that you can kind of start to to trust your instincts, kind of trust but verify. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think you're blessed with your engineering partners too. Yeah. So it's really yeah, good yeah, team. We have a great engineering team for sure. So your team is growing. And I know you have some um, senior positions um, available now in your team. Yeah. Who are you looking for? One thing I always stress in interviews is I think our group, yeah, like basically uh, the, the team that you lead, um, I think we have a really good opportunity to kind of be kind of established and be the driver for kind of like product best practices within Wayfair as a whole. Um, I think we have a really good uh, um, head of supply chain engineering who, who backs us up on these issues as well. And I think it's kind of, I think one thing I'd really like for, for people to come on board is to kind of help us kind of push this vision of, of make, help make Wayfair a real technology company, help make it a real product company. Um, so apart from, yeah, just, just, just kind of checking all the boxes of being a really good technical as well as kind of uh, user centric product manager. I think that's, that's kind of like the one spark I'd kind of be kind of be looking for mm -hmm. as we as we ramp up. So, yeah. And I had the feeling um, that you work on data so much. The type of product manager you want to work with has a natural 
inclination to work with data, right? So no. is it possible not to be hands-on in your team? No, I mean, I personally don't do any, any database queries, but I have to understand the results of those queries on a pretty granular level, yeah? Um, and sometimes the initial interpretation of that data is wrong. Um, and you have to kind of um, walk that back with the stakeholder and say, okay, we thought the situation was X, but now it's Y. Um, and the other thing is different stakeholders have different levels of technical sophistication. So you kind of have to tailor your interpretation of the data for different audiences. So that's, those are like the really data specific things I would expect a, a product manager to be able to do in our, in our space. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, baby. Um, thanks a lot for your time and My it was a pleasure. pleasure talking to you. Yeah.